In this video, we'll explore Newton's three laws of motion. The first law of motion arguably should be attributed to Galileo rather than Newton, but Newton carried it much farther, so we refer to it as Newton's first law. And probably one of the best physics teachers, if not physics minds, in history was Richard Feynman. Here's a recollection of one of his early understandings of this law. One day when I was playing with what we call an express wagon, which is a little wagon which has a railing around it, it had a ball in it, and I pulled the wagon, and I noticed something about the way the ball moved. So I went to my father and I said, say, Pop, when I pull the wagon, the ball rolls to the back of the wagon. It rushes to the back of the wagon. And when I'm pulling along and I suddenly stop, the ball rolls to the front of the wagon. I said, why is that? And he said, that, he said, nobody knows. He said, the general principle is that things that are moving try to keep on moving. And things that are standing still tend to stand still unless you push on them hard. And he says, this tendency is called inertia, but nobody knows why it's true. He went on to say, if you look close, you'll find the ball does not rush to the back of the wagon, but it's the back of the wagon that you're pulling to against the ball, that the ball stands still, or as a matter of fact, from the friction starts to move forward, really, and doesn't move back. The ball never moved backwards in the wagon when I pulled the wagon forward. It moved backward relative to the wagon, but relative to the sidewalk, it was moved forward a little bit. It's just the wagon caught up with it. And you've likely experienced something similar, when a bus stops suddenly, but your inertia carries you forward. That's why there's so many places to hold on the bus. Now the first law is mainly conceptual. There are no calculations associated directly with it. Either an object is in uniform motion or it isn't, depending on the presence of an unbalanced external force. The second law, however, takes this idea and extends it. Not only does an unbalanced external force change the motion, but the size of the force determines the amount of acceleration. Similarly, the size of the object also has an effect on the rate of change of motion. Mathematically, we say the acceleration is directly proportional to the force. That's that fish-like operator in our expression. That is, increasing the force will increase the acceleration at exactly the same rate. So the acceleration would double with twice the force. Now the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. That is, lessening the mass increases the acceleration. So half the mass will accelerate at twice the rate. Combining these two relationships consolidates this rule where the acceleration is equal to the unbalanced force divided by the mass of the object. Strictly speaking, we refer to this unbalanced force as a net force. And here are the meanings of the variables in this expression. The standard international unit for force is the Newton. We use the letter N to represent this measurement unit, while the standard units for mass and acceleration are the kilogram and meter per second squared. Now to get a sense of this derived measurement unit, the Newton, we'll arrange this formula in its more common variant, F equals MA. So here, one Newton is equal to the product of one kilogram and one meter per second squared, or we say that one Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, so we have this new equation. Let's use it with a sample problem. Let's say we push an object with a mass of 2.7 kilograms with a forward force of 6.3 newtons. How will the object accelerate? Well, using the second law equation, the acceleration is the net force divided by the object's mass. Plugging in the numbers and calculating gives us 2.3 meters per second squared. And since the force was forward, the acceleration has the same direction and the object accelerates at 2.3 meters per second squared forward. Well, that's a simple calculation. Let's consider the same force acting on an object with three times the mass. We want to determine if the acceleration is less than half the original, equal to half, or more than half the original acceleration. Take a minute to make your argument for one of these results. Well, let's consider both situations mathematically. Since we want to determine what fraction of the first acceleration results with the change in mass, we can take the ratio of the two accelerations and their force-mass relationships. So the ratio of the accelerations is the inverse of the ratio of the masses, or the new acceleration is the ratio of m1 to m2 multiplied by the original acceleration. But our new mass is three times the original mass, so the new acceleration should be one-third the original. Since the fraction one-third is less than one-half, we would go to the first response. Now we can also look at calculating the acceleration based on the values in our new situation. Using the second law equation and plugging in the values for the force and the new mass, 8.1 kilograms, we get an acceleration of 0.78 meters per second squared. Since our point of comparison is half the original, or 1.17 meters per second squared, our calculation bears out our algebraic reasoning. Where the second law concerns itself with the effect of forces on one object, Newton's third law looks at how two objects interact. Now you may have heard the expression, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. 
And while the everyday saying uses the words often associated with this law, it loses the subtle but profound implications of the law. Often the inference is the reaction is in response to but after the original action. A more robust way to describe this law is to say that whenever two objects interact, if one object exerts any force on the other, irrespective of the relative size of the objects, it always experiences a force from the second object that's equal in magnitude to its force on the other object, but opposite in direction. The third law explains why when we stand on ice and press against a fixed surface, like the boards around a rink, we move away from the boards even though we pushed in the opposite direction. Let's say we have an 81 kilogram hockey player pushing against the boards with a 45 newton force, our action force. The boards push back with a force of the same magnitude, the reaction force. Then using the second law, we can determine the hockey player's acceleration, which is 0.56 meters per second squared. And we can even connect this with our kinematics. What if the duration of the push was 0.9 seconds and the player started at rest? We can determine how far he moved during the push using the second of the big five equations. Plugging in our values, we find that he moves about 22 centimeters during the push. Now that's a simple case of one push on a stationary object, but this law gets more interesting when we look at connected objects. Let's consider a 2.7 kilogram mass right beside a 1.8 kilogram mass, and they're pushed together by a force of 10.8 newtons. They'll accelerate together as if they were one combined mass. So using the second law equation, both masses accelerate at 2.4 meters per second squared. But to see the third law in action, we'll use the second law to determine the force that the first mass exerts on the second mass. We'll call this F sub 1, 2. Using this mass and the acceleration, we find the force between the boxes must be 4.32 newtons. Okay, now if the first mass pushes the second with a force of 4.32 newtons, the first mass must be pushed backward with the same force. Now the net force acting on mass number one is the sum of these two forces in opposite directions. So the backward force is negative. And when we plug this into the second law equation for the first mass, we also get an acceleration of 2.4 meters per second squared. And this is consistent with our first acceleration result. So it seems Newton was onto something. 